So thanks, Raquel, for being here. Raquel Lovelas has a master's in science uh, in mechanical engineering from the University of Texas in Tyler in the United States and a master's in science in nuclear engineering from the University of New South Wales in Australia. Uh, so nice travel, uh, US then Australia. <laughs> and now yes. she currently, let's say, stayed in between. So she currently works in the International Atomic Energy Agency and is part of the United Nations Nuclear Young Generation Group. Uh, very interested in, in nuclear fusion and, fusion and its potential to the world. So Raquel, it's a pleasure to have you here with us uh, as a speaker today. Thanks a million and, uh, and the floor is yours for topic five. Thank you. And just want to make sure everyone can see the PowerPoint and hear me okay. okay? Perfect. Perfect. All right. So I'll just jump right into it then. We're going to go over some main challenges um, related to nuclear fusion. So I'm going to be going over a quick introduction, going over some general challenges, and then specific challenges related to the MCF and the ICF reactors. Then I'm going to go over some current projects and finish off with some conclusions. So let's start with a quick recap of what we learned so far today. In the left, we have a magnetic confinement fusion facility where we have deuterium and tritium fuel, which is heated to form a high temperature plasma. The plasma is squeezed by superconducting magnets, allowing fusion to occur. Lithium blankets are outside the plasma reaction chamber, which, help, which absorb the high energy neutrons from the reaction to help create more tritium fuel. The black blankets also get heated by the neutrons and that heat is then transferred out of the system. And the most efficient shape that we learned today was uh, this toroid uh, shape or donut shape for this uh, MCF reactor. And on the right, we have the inertial confinement fusion reaction reactor type. This uses a pellet of fuel or a capsule of fuel with the deuterium and tritium inside positioned in the center of the chamber. This is typically called the target. Energy is shot at the target in the form of laser light, electrons or ions from all sides causing the target to implode on itself, creating the heat and pressure conditions that you need for the fusion reaction. And then that propagates to the rest of the fuel. That was a quick recap. No, I know you just heard it, but <laughs> just a quick reminder so we can continue on. So some of the general challenges that are related to both of these types of reactors are how to extract the heat from the system, how to ensure that we have a sufficient rate of tritium reproduction, and of course, radiation protection for the materials that are used in the reactors. And then we have some specific uh, challenges. For the MCF, we're gonna look at the confinement times, plasma instabilities, and superconductor technology. And for the ICF, we're gonna look at laser plasma interactions, the laser technology, and logistics in the target injection. So let's start with general challenges. Now the breeding blanket and the integrated, usually first wall is recognized as one of the principal remaining challenges that we need to realize fusion power. The neutrons from the fusion reaction, you know, they're slowed down by the breeding blanket and this generates heat and that needs to be extracted. And also at the same time, as was mentioned, it interacts with the lithium in the blanket to create more tritium. Now there's several concepts that are being investigated right now, and here's a few of them uh, on the slideshow. On the top right, this is the water-cooled lithium lead uh, example, and then the other three are all helium-cooled uh, examples. So the left two, the HCPB, or the helium-cooled pebble bed, and the bottom left, the helium-cooled lithium lead in terms of materials, technologies, and operating conditions, these have been developed over the past two decades here in Europe. Both concepts use a low activation structural steel and there are pressurized helium for the heat extraction. The one on the bottom right, which is the DCLL, this is a dual coolant lead lithium blanket. And in this one, they have the liquid metal, the lead lithium, um, which serves both to produce the tritium and to help remove some of the heat that's deposited in the breeding zone. And they also, on top of that, use helium to also help uh, cool the whole, the whole system as well. Now, in order to achieve a self-sustaining operation, the breeding ratio must be greater than one for any of the concepts that are used. So as was mentioned in a previous lecture today, uh, tritium is not um, widely available here on Earth. So we have to make sure that we, we are able to make it in the reactions so that we're be able to use it for future reactions. Now there are similar challenges related to like this heat extraction and the breeding blankets 
in ICF reactors, but the solutions are completely different. Um, so there are a number of ICF reactor plant projects with different types of these first wall designs. And the designs are typically broken up into two categories. So on one side, you have dry walled chambers, and on the other, you have wet walled chambers. The dry walled chambers are how they're named, and they're just the, the metal, or sorry, the, yeah, I mean, essentially, usually metal. Um, they're relatively easy and simple to fabricate. However, they're subject to the high x-ray pulses that results then in high stresses in the material. So to help combat this, you have the other option, which is the wet walled chambers, and they consist of a fluid that's flushed along the inside of the chamber uh, to help absorb some of the x-ray energy that's coming off from the, the reactions. And some of the examples that I want to highlight here. So High Life 2, this uses a refrigerant of about 60 centimeters thick that's on the um, inside of the, the inside wall of the chamber. And um, they use jets, sorry, to, to fire this refrigerant along the inside of the wall. And this helps to extract the heat that's generated from the particles coming from the fusion reaction. And it also generates the tritium because this is uh, lithium, uh, lithium lead refrigerant. Then we have the Sombrero project, which uh, is a drywall of composite material based on carbon fiber. And it has a breeder blanket consisting of a fluid bed of the lithium oxide. And what this one also does, since it's using the drywall chamber, it uses xenon gas to help protect the first wall. Then we have Hyper, which is also a dry chamber, which is investigating a modular system. And that's what's shown here in the bottom right. And so this has removable tiles as 16 independent tiles for each hemisphere that they can remove as needed. And then the last one um, that I want to highlight was, is being de developed by the Japanese. And it's a wet wall chamber using a porous silicon carbide. Now, both reactor types, radiation protection of the structure is still a challenge. The first wall materials, they need to have low activation potential, high temperature and corrosion resistance, as well as insensitivity to neutron irradiation. This Eurofur steel was developed as the European reference material for a future um, demo. It's called Demo. It's a demonstration fusion power plant. And estimates have shown that the thermodynamic efficiency for, the, for this type of steel is around 37%. And another one that's being investigated as a good candidate is silicon carbide based composites, which has an estimated thermodynamic efficiency of 45%. Now those are some of the general challenges and I'm gonna jump into specific challenges to each type of reactors. For the MCF, the energy confinement time measures the rate at which the confined plasma starts to lose its energy to the environment. So as mentioned before, we wanna to try to keep the confinement time and the pulse durations long. Now the graph here on the left shows the power uh, by pulse duration. And currently we have ITER here, which has a five second pulse duration with the goal to be in the order of magnitudes of thousands. So yeah, that's what we want here. This is what we want, thousands of seconds and beyond that for the demo power plant. The graph on the right, we have measured uh, confinement time by expected confinement time and which for 13 installations across the world. And you can see here that there's a really nice correlation between the measured and the, the expected but we're nowhere near the, the times that we, we want to be. So like I said, either is at five seconds and we wanna be in thousands of seconds. Next are these uh, disruptions. And these are complex phenomena related to instabilities in the plasma. And this leads to the complete loss of thermal and magnetic energy that's stored in the plasma. This only occurs in MCF reactors. See if this video is working. Yeah, so the video shown here, this is a disruption that's at the joint European Tokamak in 2005. And on this chart here, you can see that, and just I know it's um, heat flux here, and then we have duration on the bottom. And this is just showing that a plasma disruption can have heat fluxes of thousands of megawatts per meter squared in just a tenth of a second. This is a really cool video showing uh, one of these disruptions. So EL, ELMs or edge localized modes, these are a type of disruption. And this happens on the edge region of the plasma. 
Um, there's two approaches to this that need to be um, investigated or used. And one of them is the study of the plasma physics. And this is so you can be able to simulate and model when a disruption is gonna happen. And then adding to that, you need the technological solution, which includes designing systems to mitigate that plasma disruption. So these mitigation systems have to protect the components against the heat and the forces that are gonna arise during the disruption, as well as to tame the electrons that are gonna be shooting out. And if generated could melt or um, destroy or, uh, the, the components of the structural system of the reactor. Diverters are used for this case. So diverters are used in these MCF reactors to extract the heat, to extract larger particles are called ash, that are produced by the fusion reaction to reduce the plasma contamination and to help um, protect the surrounding walls from that overly high heat and um, that's created by these disruptions. Now, superconducting uh, magnets are of course needed for our magnetic confinement fusion. Um, and these are superconducting materials need to have high electric current density. The magnetic system forms the core of this fusion reactor. So that means that the magnet technology defines the operational limits of the plasma as well as the core machine size and cost. The low temperature superconductor magnets, this LTS, um, they're in operation and in under construction for fusion devices throughout the world, including at ITER. Um, but this technology was developed in the 90s, so it could be improved. <laughs> Um, one thing that's being investigated is these HTS, is the high temperature superconductor magnets that are in development and they exhibit very high critical current at temperatures above that of boiling liquid nitrogen. So now we're just gonna jump right into the inertial confinement, inertial confinement fusion uh, specific challenges. So as mentioned before, we have the indirect drive targets and the direct drive targets. And in both of these cases, you can have undesirable laser plasma interactions. And these can include backscattering of light, which results in loss of energy, uh, cross beam. So, you know, don't, don't, uh, Oh my gosh, I can't, I forgot the line from the <laughs> Ghostbusters movie. Don't cross the beams, right? Uh, this also results in loss of energy. Um, you can have uh, these hot electrons that are coming off and are preheating the capsule before you want it to heat. And this uh, limits the implosion. And then you can have other uh, types of interactions like filamentation, which just makes the other reactions, or sorry, interactions worse. Another challenge specific to ICFs is the laser technology. So the lasers need to have um, the energy efficiency and the repetition rate for the 30 plus years of the plant life. They should be able to have, are capable of power intensities of a half to one and a half megajoules and operate in the UV spectrum because the laser plasma interactions are worse in the longer wavelengths. They also must be uniform and have efficiencies over 6%. And right now there's two that are generally being looked at. Um, this is the diode pumped solid state laser and the krypton fluoride laser. And then we have the target injection. So there's four main challenges with this target injection. For the optimal energy output, that target needs to be uniformly compressed by the laser beams. So first you have accuracy and repeatability. This means that the target needs to arrive at the same time, or sorry, at the same point in space and at the same instant as the multiple laser beams. And you need to be able to do that every single time. The second challenge here is the ability to track the laser, or sorry, track the target in real time so that you can make corrections to the laser beams. The third technological challenge is preserving the target's critical specifications until that moment of implosion. So the challenges are a bit different between the direct drive and the indirect drive, but they're dependent on things like the gas pressure, the overall time the target's in the chamber, and temperature of the chamber. And then finally, you have this chamber clearing. So you need to be able to clear the chamber of any debris between shots. Now, there are a lot of people out there working out the details to make fusion possible. And one of those is the International Fusion Materials Irradiation Facility, or the IFMIF. And this is a projected materials test facility that's being installed in Spain that will be used to test and qualify materials for use in the energy producing fusion reactors. 
The IFMIF is an accelerator-based neutron source that produces using deuterium lithium nuclear reactions, a large neutron flux. And this has a spectrum that's similar to what we would expect in at the first wall of fusion reactors. So the IFMIF will have an accelerator facility with two accelerator beams, a target facility, which will hold the inventory of lithium, the test facility, which provides high, medium, and low flux regions, and the post-irradiation examination facility. And the IFMIF has a current estimated operation start in 2029. So I just want to finish off with some conclusions, and it was a lot of information. Um, first, the MCF and the ICF reactors both share some challenges, such as how to extract heat from the system, how to make sure you have a good tritium reproduction model, and the materials that need to be used for the first wall and breeding blanket need to be um, protected against the radiation. Specific to the MCF, you need to be uh, aware of the disruptions and be able to account for those because these cause high thermal fluxes can mess up uh, your reactions. To the ICF, there's the design of new technologies such as the lasers and the target injection systems. And then current projects that are underway to help with the material part of all of this, which is um, one of the main challenges that we had uh, just like as an overall challenge. And we have for this purpose, the IFMIF project, which is currently in progress with the estimated projection date, start date in 2029. So that was a lot of information again. I look forward to any questions that you might have and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.